Tonight, it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Kerry Krieger, who's going to talk about amphibian conservation. He is the founder and the executive director of Save the Frogs. It's a not-profit organization dedicated to protecting amphibian populations. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Virginia and a PhD in environmental science from Griffith University in Gold Coast, Australia. He's taught at all levels and including university courses in ecology, vertebrate biology, applied mathematics and chemistry. He's published 15 articles in peer-reviewed journals on the amphibian disease, chytridiomycosis. He uh, teaches not only science and mathematics, he also teaches music. And uh, tonight he's going to play two instruments for us. One is a bamboo flute called the bansuri that comes from northern India. And he also has a jaw harp uh, that is, a, is, is played in Vietnam and he can make it sound like frog calls. Uh, very interesting guy who has done very important work on, in amphibian conservation efforts. He's done educational outreach, habitat restoration, legislative advocacy, and his work has been supported by the National Geographic Society, the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund, Patagonia, and a number of philanthropic organizations throughout the world. He lives this wonderful nomadic life. He doesn't have any permanent address all over the world studying amphibians and other things in nature, and he's a great advocate for all amphibians. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kerry Krieger. Thanks to all of you for coming out uh, my name is Dr. Kerry Krieger. I'm the founder and executive director of Save the Frogs. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to protect amphibian populations and to promote a society that respects and appreciates nature and wildlife. I'm going to be talking about the natural history of amphibians, how they live, the threats they face, why they're important, ways we can save them, and also about the work that I do at Save the Frogs and that our organization has done uh, around the world uh, to benefit amphibian populations. So first off, uh, amphibians. There's five main types of amphibians. The frogs are the most commonly known and the most commonly seen. Pacific horse frogs live uh, all up the coast of the western USA and Canada. Toads are really just a type of frog, so frogs and toads are one of the three main groups of amphibians. And this is the famous cane toad. Then there's the salamanders and the newts. Newts are really just a type of salamander. So the salamanders and newts have a tail, and amphibians live in lots of different habitats. This one right here I actually found uh, high up in the mountains, and it was above snow line under a rock. So amphibians are living in the mountains, in the deserts, the rainforests, uh, savannas, lots of different habitats. California has a lot of amphibians. This is one right here, the arboreal salamander. California slender salamander, he's curled up in a defensive posture. Salamanders uh, often can be found underneath fallen logs. That's where this one was. They like it because it's cool and moist there, and they're uh, safe from most of their predators. Yellow-eyed Encetina, really cool salamander. This was up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I actually grew up in Virginia near the Shenandoah Mountains. This is one of the common salamanders out east. So newts, as I said, are just a type of salamander. Newts have lots of toxins on their skin, especially the California newt, so toxic that it could kill you if you ate it, so don't do that. Or uh, if it crawled into your cup of coffee, as happened to some guy about 15 years ago, and he did not have a happy ending. So watch out for those newts. But amphibians in general are pretty harmless because they're not out attacking you. They're not gonna bite you unless you really put your finger 
uh, near their mouth, and then even then they probably won't. Uh, pretty harmless animal in general. So here's the fifth type of amphibian. There's the frogs and toads, the newts and salamanders, and the little known Sicilians. I've actually never seen one of these out in the wild. They're fossorial, meaning they live underground, so they're hard to find, and then they don't live in the United States. They're in Latin America and parts of Africa and Asia. So I'm hoping to see one sometime soon. The term herpetology means the study of amphibians and or reptiles. And that term is kind of outdated. It came from several hundred years ago when people thought that amphibians and reptiles were the same. But now we know that they're very different. Uh, to begin with, reptiles like this rainforest dragon have scales and their eggs are much different. Reptiles, when they have eggs, have a hard-shelled egg. But amphibians have a jelly-like egg. Now these eggs, foothill yellow-legged frog, an endangered frog that lives in California further up north, these are underwater in a river right now. Same river I found these California red-legged frogs. This is extremely important for amphibians, the fact that they don't have that hard egg, the hard shell on the egg, because this means that if their eggs dry out, then they will die. And that's why amphibians get active in the rainy season, they live in uh, ponds and streams, swamps. They like to be in wet places. The term, the name amphibian means that they have two lives, one on land, one in water. Another differentiating factor between amphibians and reptiles is metamorphosis. And most frogs and toads, but not all of them, will have a tadpole stage and they will have gills when they're a tadpole. They will eventually grow their legs and then arms. The tail does not drop off. It absorbs into their body. They use that for energy. And then they're at this halfway stage right here. They're called a metamorph, and they'll be like that probably a few weeks. And then they're an adult frog, and the cycle continues. They have external fertilization, and this uh, mating embrace is called amplexus. Frogs and amphibians are really interesting also because they have permeable skin. Their skin is not like ours. Our skin is meant to keep things out, but they actually can uh, take in oxygen and water directly through their skin. There are some amphibians that do not have lungs even as adults because they can get all of their oxygen directly through their skin. Frogs are called gape-limited predators. They will eat whatever they can put in their mouth as long as it's a living animal. They're carnivores, and uh, so it doesn't matter if it's some insects, eggs, another frog, beetles, slugs, mosquitoes. Uh, if they can catch it, put it in their mouth, then they're quite happy. So I grew up in Virginia, and when I was young, my parents built a pond on the property, and I spent a lot of time there at the pond. And I didn't know it at the time, but now I know there's about seven different species that live there. So it's really great amphibian habitat. When I was young, I'd go down there, and then at night in the summer, I'd often be sleeping with the windows open. And into my subconscious, I would be hearing and as well as spring peepers, one of the most common frogs on the East Coast. They get their name because they so I'd have all these frog calls coming into my mind, and I think that probably affected me because eventually I went to Australia and spent four years there researching amphibians for my PhD research into the ecology of an amphibian disease, chytridiomycosis, that I'll tell you about shortly. I got into uh, environmental conservation because I like to go camping, I like hiking and nature, spent a lot of time outside, spent a lot of time traveling around the world, and saw a lot of beautiful places, but also a lot of habitat destruction, which I wanted to uh, do something beneficial for the planet, and I've always been interested in science. I like being outside, like hanging out at streams, and when I found out that frogs were rapidly disappearing, it sounded like a great um, study subject for my PhD. And soon after I started in Australia, I definitely fell in love with frogs just from spending a lot of time uh, in the rainforest, hanging out with frogs, seeing 
uh, their beautiful colors, their calls, how they live, and they're just amazing animals. So here's some of the frogs that I researched and spent a lot of time with in Australia. Cascade tree frog, one of my main um, frogs that I was doing my research on. And I actually had to get good at calling to the frogs because I had to find them and actually I would catch them with a plastic bag, take a cotton swab over their skin to um, look for disease and I'd let them go. But I had to catch them so I'd have to be able to find them. Frogs can be pretty shy, especially when you get close and if they're camouflage, they're hard to find. But if you call to them, then uh, the male frogs will often call back and the male frogs are out there. It's called a advertisement call. They're advertising to a mate. They're also saying this is my territory. So when I was calling to them, such as, <coughs> then they'd often call back to say, this is my territory. Go away. <laughs> my favorite frog, people often ask me, what's your favorite frog? It's this frog, the southern orange-eyed tree frog. Such beautiful eyes. They have pretty much no anti-predator defense. They'll just be up there calling. And you can just put your camera in their face, take pictures, and they're quite happy. And they come out when it's pouring rain. They live at the edges of waterfalls in the rainforest. So they always, uh, whenever there's southern orange-eyed tree frogs calling, you're usually in a pretty amazing spot out in the rainforest. Pobblebonk gets their name from their bonk, bonk. Eastern sedge frog is common. They can do pretty well in suburban ponds, like parking lot runoff types of ponds that may be a little bit disturbed, maybe a little bit of pollution, but they do fine there. We can see um, his vocal sac. I know he's male because only male frogs call. So if you see the vocal sac and if you hear them uh, making their sound, this one's kind of ratchet sounding like <coughs> then you know it's a male frog. Great barred frog, you can see the bars on the legs, one of five types of barred frogs. It's the only one that's not endangered. It's a big frog. Big frogs have deep calls. Bark, bark. Striped marsh frog, uh, pretty obvious where they get their name from. And this is probably the single easiest frog call to make. I think you all can do it. So we can probably recreate the sound of the Australian marsh right here. It's like this. That was good. You guys are good. <laughs> marsupial frog is a really interesting frog. They're not a marsupial, but you can see a pouch right there. This is a male. Full grown, the male is about that big. Very small frog. So you can imagine that pouch is very small. In that pouch, about uh, 15 little froglets will crawl and live uh, safe from predators for about a month. These frogs are really interesting. They're terrestrial breeders. They bypass the aquatic tadpole stage. They may never go to water. The eggs get laid in the moist leaves, and then uh, they emerge just as baby froglets. A lot of amphibians um, have this method of living, method of reproduction. A lot of frogs guard their young. It may be in pouches, maybe tadpoles on their back, may just be sitting near the clutch of eggs and protecting them. Frogs are really incredible animals, but unfortunately, they're extremely threatened. And uh, there's about 2,000 amphibian species that are known to be threatened with extinction. There's probably another thousand plus that are threatened, but they're considered data deficient because people just haven't been able to study and assess their populations. But usually those populations are hard to study because they're so small to begin with. Small populations are prone to extinction. So unfortunately, the true number is probably a lot higher than this. And bad news is that a couple hundred amphibian species have gone extinct in the last few decades. So amphibians are actually the most rapidly disappearing group of animals. And the human population continues to grow. So if we don't stop what's causing these problems, then we can expect more amphibians to go extinct in the near future. So the first step to saving the frogs is to know what are 
the threats that frogs face. And there's six primary threats to amphibians. Biggest problem worldwide, especially in lowland areas, is habitat destruction. There's a lot of people on the planet. Most people live in the lowlands where it's flat or near water, near the ocean. And most of our protected areas tend to be up in the mountains because we like how mountains look and it's hard to live in the mountains anyway, so why not protect the mountains? So that means there's a lot of conflict in the lowlands between people and frogs. So there's timber extraction, uh, clear cutting, agriculture. Um, California tiger salamander is one of our threatened amphibian species that's uh, affected by habitat destruction. Another one is the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander that lives in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. And one of the world's most endangered amphibians, they're only known to exist at 23 different ponds. And between these ponds, is a lot of monoculture. If you were a Santa Cruz long-toed salamander, you'd have to crawl through this. And there's not a lot of shade cover. You may dry up in the sun, get picked off by a predator, have to cross a road. Sugar cane, a lot of our uh, big crops that we eat are grown as monocultures, and this is pretty bad habitat for amphibians or any type of wildlife. Palm oil in the last a decade or two has become the most common uh, cooking oil in the world, and unfortunately, a lot of it comes from tropical rainforests that get clear cut and then set on fire and then turned into a monoculture of palm. So that's bad news for amphibians. Mining for gold, uh, aluminum, lots of other minerals. Uh, sometimes it's legal, sometimes it's illegal, like this. Uh, mining that I saw when I was in Ghana. And there's mining all over, all over the world. A lot of it is just bad news for amphibians, not just because the forest gets chopped down, but a lot of chemicals are introduced into those habitats. Frogs are taken out of the wild for use as pets, over harvesting. Uh, some of that's legal, some of it's black market, especially colorful frogs. Poison dart frogs have a high risk of being taken out for the pet trade. This frog has the most uh, potent toxin of any amphibian. Critically endangered, lives in western Colombia. Frog legs are a big problem. Humans eat about a billion frogs a year. Frogs that get taken out of the wild, there's a few hundred million that are also grown on farms. Farm-raised frogs have lots of associated problems as well. Indonesia is the number one consumer and exporter of frogs for food. Uh, France and Belgium are number one and two. America is actually number three. And California is the um, epicenter of frogs being imported for use as food. There's at least two million non-native American bullfrogs get imported into California each year, primarily for use as food. I'll be talking about the bullfrog problem soon. California red-legged frog almost got eaten to extinction by the California gold miners. And uh, part of the reason the bullfrogs got here originally is because this frog almost disappeared. People brought the bullfrog as a new food source. Non-native species like fish that get introduced into the high Sierra Nevada mountains in what used to be fishless lakes and streams. The frogs that live up there have not evolved defenses against the amphibians. So their tadpoles probably are not toxic. They're not camouflage. They don't know how to hide very well. And if you introduce fish into those lakes, the fish can completely decimate the amphibian populations. Mountain yellow-legged frogs used to be one of the most common frogs in California. And now they are gone from 93% of their historic localities, in large part due to all the fish that have been introduced. The state of California. Um, has for decades been flying over these lakes, dropping out tens of thousands of baby fish into naturally fishless lakes. Non-native crayfish, like this red swamp crayfish, native to the Gulf Coast of the USA, invasive species in Spain, Portugal, coastal California, and they like to eat frogs. So here's the American bullfrog. It's native to the eastern half of the USA and Canada 
but they, there are now millions living in California. It's the largest frog in North America. Big frogs have big mouths. Frogs are gape limited predators, so they'll eat whatever they can fit in their mouth. Uh, one bullfrog got found with a 33 inch garter snake inside of its stomach. So they can eat uh, California red legged frogs, whatever frogs they encounter, California tiger salamanders, and cause lots of problems. Frogs have permeable skin. They're going to absorb whatever chemicals are in the water. So if there's pollution coming from factories, cars, people's homes, then can have a bad impact on frogs. Atrazine, one of at least 1,800 registered pesticides in the United States. Atrazine, one of the most commonly used herbicides in the world. Number one herbicide on corn, which is our number one crop in America. It's an endocrine disruptor. It can turn male frogs into females at two and a half parts per billion. Causes lots of uh, reproductive deformities. And uh, it's the number one pesticide contamin contaminating American tap water, rainwater, and groundwater. USDA found atrazine in 94% of the American tap water uh, samples that they took. Climate change is a problem for amphibians like this frog that lives in Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone uh, has had persistent droughts for half a century, and a lot of those ponds are now drying up. Three of the four amphibian species in Yellowstone are declining in numbers, even though Yellowstone is uh, perhaps the oldest protected area on the planet. So it's protected, but not from climate change, not from infectious diseases. And the final significant threat to amphibians is chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium uh, dendrobatitis, and now a new type of chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium salamander vorans. And these fungi have been spread around the world, probably by human transport, because humans ship about 100, 100 million amphibians around the world each year for pets, food, bait, laboratory, and often with no disease testing or quarantine. So if a sick amphibian arrives in a new place and it gets loose or the water it was in gets loose, then it can put diseases out into the wild. And chytrid fungus does a great job living anywhere where it is cool and moist. So any mountain range or many mountain ranges in the world, Sierra Nevadas, uh, the Cordillera through Central America, the Andes, the mountains in Australia and New Zealand, Tanzania, these places have lots of amphibians that have had trouble with chytrid fungus. And chytrid fungus has caused about 100 amphibians to go extinct. So in terms of biodiversity, it's the worst disease in recorded history for not just amphibians, but any type of organism. There's no uh, disease that has ever driven so many species to extinction that we know of. So why should we care about frogs? Frogs are important for a variety of reasons. They're eating ticks, flies, mosquitoes, and other um, vectors of diseases that we don't want. So they're definitely doing us a favor they're an integral part of the food web. They're food for snakes, monkeys, dragonflies, beetles. Uh, lots of animals eat frogs. If the frogs disappear, then uh, other animals are impacted. Tadpoles filter algae from the water, doing a lot of uh, the work of bringing us clean water. So it keeps the cost of our water down if you're dependent on water that's coming through a city uh, filtration system. About 10% of the Nobel Prizes in phys Physiology and Medicine have gone to researchers whose work depended on amphibians. We get a lot of knowledge from having amphibians alive. Once they go extinct, then we can't learn much from them. Frogs are bioindicators, so they're an early warning system. They're telling us that something's, if the frogs are disappearing, it's telling us that something is wrong in the environment. They're bioindicators because they have the permeable skin, they're amphibious, they're dependent on healthy land and water, and they're slow to move. If their uh, swamp gets drained or their forest gets chopped down, they can't just fly off like a bird. They're um, gonna have to travel across roads, perhaps, and a lot of them are just genetically programmed to not be traveling very far. So 
when amphibians are disappearing, they're telling us to uh, make some changes in the environment and fix things. And even though they are sensitive, they have survived for hundreds of millions of years in more or less their current form. They outlived the dinosaurs, they've survived asteroid crashes, ice ages. So the fact that about a third of them are threatened with extinction in the last half century says that there's some pretty significant damage being done to the environment. And of course, frogs are cool. People like frogs. Most of you are here probably because you like frogs. So there's a lot of reasons for us to save the frogs. It's our ethical responsibility to protect them. And they have as much right to exist on the planet as we do. And future generations of humans will be happy that we save the frogs instead of driving them to extinction. Fortunately, there's lots of ways that all of you can help save frogs. You can start by not using pesticides around your home. Eat locally grown food that wasn't shipped from far away using lots of fuel contributing to climate change. Organic food without pesticides. Definitely don't eat frogs. Slow down driving on wet nights. Lots of cars on the roads and a lot of frogs get unfortunately run over. So if you see one frog jumping around, there's probably more. Slow down, look where you're going. Uh, don't purchase wild caught amphibians. Always stick with native plants and wildlife on your own property when possible. Don't waste water, water coming out of the tap. Uh, probably, especially in the American West, there's not a lot of water. It's probably drying out some stream somewhere. Uh, the process of bottling water and the plastic and transporting it to you is incredibly bad on the environment. So try to use reusable uh, water. Rechargeable batteries, great way to save money and the environment. Batteries. Uh, Americans go through a couple billion a year. They're packed full of heavy metals that eventually drain down into the water bodies where the amphibians are living and breeding. How we vote is incredibly important. Do some research on the politicians who are running and find a frog-friendly politician if one exists. Uh, reducing your meat consumption, in particular cattle. Uh, cattle are usually grown where there used to be forest. People chop down the forest. Number one cause of deforestation of the Amazon is uh, chopping down the forest to make room for cattle. Spreading the word is incredibly important because if people don't know that there's a problem, then it's very hard to fix the problem. So please um, educate your friends, family, colleagues about amphibians and ways to save them. You all now know a lot more about amphibians than most people, so you are all certified to spread the word. So I'm going to tell you about Save the Frogs, which is a nonprofit organization that I founded in 2008, shortly after finishing my PhD research, uh, which was in Australia. I came back to America. I was thinking about what the next step in my career should be and what would be the most um, productive use of my time with respect to protecting amphibians. And what I realized was there was no nonprofit organization dedicated exclusively to uh, amphibians. And there was a lot that was not getting done that needed to get done, particularly educating the public, getting proper legislation in place, and um, just getting the word out about amphibians. People would always ask me during my PhD, why do you care about frogs? And I always thought, if nobody knows frogs are disappearing and nobody knows why I should care, then we're in trouble. So for the first 18 months of Save the Frogs, the only thing that we did was environmental education. One of the longest running programs, the most successful programs of ours is Save the Frogs Day, which takes place the last Saturday of April every year. The 10th annual Save the Frogs Day is coming up April 29th of 2018. Uh, over the past decade, our supporters and staff, but primarily volunteers, have held at least 1,200 Save the Frogs Day events in 57 countries. 
to educate their communities about amphibians or otherwise take action for amphibians. We've had lots of types of events. This is an event that I um, led in Washington, D.C. at the steps of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to call for a federal ban on the use of atrazine, the herbicide that can turn male frogs into females. So we had about 40 people show up. Lots of news reporters were there. And we marched through the streets of D.C., had the police actually stopping traffic for us, which was kind of cool, and took it to the White House. And EPA heard about the rally, invited me to speak there the, a week later. I've since been back to the EPA. I've been there three times to um, educate their scientific staff about frogs and the problems with atrazine. And I also delivered to them um, that day 10,000 petition signatures, but uh, at least 30,000 over the years. And even back in 2011, they were telling me that they were about to make their decision on whether to allow atrazine to continue to be sold. And so right now, six years later, they still have not made their decision, but they're always working on it. So maybe in another six or seven years, they'll have a decision, hopefully sooner. But this is a billion dollar industry. Atrazine is made by Syngenta, the world's largest pesticide company, bigger than Monsanto. And um, there's billions of dollars. One time I spoke at the EPA, it was a public hearing. And I was the only person speaking against atrazine. There were 28 people there from the lobby, lobby um, side of things to keep atrazine legal. So it's a difficult um, battle if people are not vocal. Uh, here's another Save the Frogs Day event that happened up in Santa Cruz to restore habitat for endangered California red-legged frogs. This pond has non-native weeds, non-native fish, non-native crayfish, non-native bullfrogs, so trying to make a better habitat. Save the Frogs Day, other things people do, scientists taking people out uh, to show them frogs in their native habitat. This is actually Brandon Balanger of the Save the Frogs Board of Directors. He's an environmental um, artist and educator, so he took people out. There's a lot of people who've never seen wild frogs. If they're living in a city, they may never get outside on a wet, rainy night. Most people usually go inside then. So it's good to introduce people to their native amphibians. Lots of schools taking part in Save the Frogs Day events, holding presentations much like this, uh, getting their kids to draw frog art. A lot of kids organizing events. Avalon was 10 at the time. She's held maybe five Save the Frogs Day events. I would get uh, 80 people or so. Nepal, this group held the first ever national seminar on frogs. A lot of activity in South Asia on Save the Frogs Day. This is in South Korea. They're celebrating at the site of a wetland that they help protect. A student group in Uganda in southern Africa. This is me in Colombia at one of the main science museums in Medellin, Colombia. I gave a presentation there, had an informational table out. Texas Tech University set a Guinness Book of World Record record on Save the Frogs Day for the most people ever at one time in one place wearing frog masks. Uh, for two years, we held 5K events in Seattle at Seward Park. And the year that I went, we had about 260 runners. Uh, myself and three other amphibian biologists gave presentations there. Uh, Yosemite National Park and some other national parks have held Save the Frogs Day events. This one with the National Wildlife Federation. Ranger Rick there with our orange-eyed tree frog. Bangladesh has been very active saving frogs, uh, which I'm especially happy about given that I've never even been to Bangladesh. But they held uh, many large events like this one, marching through urban centers to raise awareness and also taking students out to the field to um, do some field projects, visiting schools. It's an event in India. And we've sent a lot of Save the Frogs Day funding to these countries, specifically developing uh, developing countries to help out with their Save the Frogs Day events. We've sent, about, sent out about $20,000 in awards to help these groups organize their events. 
Over the years, Save the Frogs has given out about $73,000 in grants. And Save the Frogs Day gets a lot of publicity. Front page of Le Monde, uh, largest paper in France, country where they eat a lot of frogs. Two minute spot on CNN TV, a lot of political support. We've gotten Save the Frogs Day officially recognized in six states and some major cities as well, often from teenagers who take the um, initiative to write their politicians and make these things happen. So I hope that um, all of you, hopefully even the aquarium, can set up an event to celebrate the 10th annual Save the Frogs Day. Sorry, our dates are wrong here. I need to update this, but it'll be April, the last Saturday of April 2018, which I think is also the 29th of April. Other activities I do for Save the Frogs, I give a lot of presentations to schools, universities, um, government agencies, community groups to get the word out about amphibians. And a lot of them in California, San Francisco, especially we've given lots of presentations there. North Carolina is where this is. North Carolina has 91 known amphibian species, the most biodiversity uh, for amphibians of any state in the United States. And this school, very inspirational. Um, young kids, they wanted to help frogs. And I talked with their teacher, and we decided that they'd write their uh, politician, Assembly Member Manuel Perez, and say, hey, California doesn't have a state amphibian. Let's get one. And so visited the school, gave a presentation. Another Save the Frogs biologist gave a presentation. And eventually, we all went up to Sacramento and testified on behalf of the frogs. We won this vote eight to zero, won the next vote 52 to eight. I'm sure you can imagine how difficult it is to uh, have a landslide on a vote like that, but we succeeded and Governor Jerry Brown signed uh, the legislation to make the California red-legged frog our official state amphibian. And uh, that's really good because a lot of students in particular learn about their state uh, wildlife when they're in school. So a lot more kids learning about amphibians now, and hopefully inspired by these students who took action. We held an online course dedicated to protecting a population of toads in Canada, one of the last three populations of Fowler's toads there. And there were developers trying to build a 12-story condominium complex right on top of the frogs. And it got so controversial that they canceled that project, so we saved Lake Erie's toads, which I'm very happy about. And we also saved some foothill yellow-legged frogs, one of California's endangered amphibians. The city of San Francisco wanted to uh, do some construction right in a stretch of river, the Alameda Creek in Little Yosemite Canyon. And that would have been bad news for the frogs. So we actually hired an environmental attorney who sent them a letter saying, what you're doing is illegal. Please stop. 10 days later, they canceled that project. I've put a lot of work into banning the importation of bullfrogs into California. As I said, two million of these get imported every year. We did succeed in the city and county of Santa Cruz. Statewide, though, they're still coming in. Politicians, the only significant step that's been taken is that the state of California has actually admitted that it's a problem. They created a report detailing the problem, but they still have not done anything to stop the importation, even though everyone agrees that the importation is harmful to California's wildlife. So if you want to contact the Department of Fish and Wildlife, I encourage you to do that. City of San Francisco drains the Sharp Park wetlands, pumps them out to sea, even during droughts, in order to create dry land to play golf. And right on the other side of that pump is where the California red-legged frogs put their eggs. When the water goes down, the eggs get stranded. One year, the city reported having to move 107 egg masses. Now, probably the mother of those baby frogs knew a lot better about where the egg masses should be than the people who moved them. I'm sure a lot of those egg masses did not survive. This is ongoing. We've made some gains as far as improving how they manage the property, but they're still pumping the wetlands out to sea every year when it floods there. So. Golf is cool, but destroying wildlife habitat is not. There's 1,100 golf courses in the state of California. 
And so this is actually a, a Save the Frogs Day rally we held at City Hall. We've been encouraging people to build frog ponds, and we've been building ponds ourselves to refrog America. Habitat destruction is a huge problem, so a huge solution is to build and restore habitat. School in San Francisco had Pacific horse frogs living in there when I visited them. Here's another school I visited in Columbia. They had two frog species calling that day when I was there. And so we've been building wetlands, some of them on our own, some of them teaming up with government agencies and other nonprofits. Uh, El Dorado National Forest had not had California red-legged frogs living in the forest on the property for about 50 years until we built uh, a set of, I think, about 11 wetlands a few years ago, and then a couple more wetlands last year or earlier this year. So this is our wetland team, and we're actually working on building a wetland at a school in LA in October. This is a school in Santa Cruz, and we spent two days there, had the kids out there helping. Uh, the kids love being out there. It's good exercise, too. They're digging. They're outside. Found a toad. And now they have an outdoor educational um, real classroom to learn science and see frogs. This school in Redwood City, uh, they used to have a wetland there. It got drained. They created a ditch there because a lot of people don't like wetlands. So when they built that school, they wanted it dry. We wanted to fix it up. So we spent two days there at the school. We had 700 kids come out to help us over the course of two days. And I'm sure it was one of their uh, most memorable activities of the whole year. They were loving it. Um, now this. I showed him, uh, that was a pub, and he actually raised $4,400. He was 15 years old. He raised $4,400 to uh, assist this project. Pretty amazing. Um, Green, Green Kids Conference is a conference that he organizes. So our wetland program has been really successful as far as uh, giving frogs new habitat, getting schools, learning, and thinking about amphibians, and uh, it's probably one of the best ways to protect amphibians. Yeah, I have trouble cutting out photos because there's so many, so many good photos. Um, Amanda Cooper, Save the Frogs volunteer for several years. She holds uh, educational informational tables at environmental events and does a lot to get the word out. And this is a pond that we built at a high school surrounded by California tiger salamanders, Santa Cruz long-toed salamanders, California red-legged frogs. Built that in one day. Sorry, I forgot to put in the picture of it with water. But here we can see this. I took part in a five-day course in Kentucky, a wetland construction course, former mining site. And we built that in five days. A couple days later, it rained, and there were eggs laid in that pond uh, within two days of that rainfall. So we know that the wetlands work. Am I correct in saying I have two minutes, or what, what's my time restriction? OK, so I have a lot more to talk about, but <clears throat> don't have time. But Save the Frogs Gone is one of my favorite Save the Frogs projects and one of the things I'm most proud of. So I went there in 2011. I only knew one person. We had exchanged like two emails. And that was Gilbert. Adam, he, who's now the executive director of Save the Frogs Ghana. We formed our first chapter in Ghana and visited schools, gave presentations in universities, set up a university chapter. Um, we now have multiple chapters. We're working on protecting the Atiwa Hills, trying to create a national park for one of the world's most endangered amphibians, Togo Slippery Frog. They live um, on two total streams on the planet. It's one of our university groups working to protect them. Uh, we've had Save the Frogs Day parades in Ghana. And one of our main projects there is to protect the giant squeaker frog, which hopefully we'll see a picture of shortly. Uh, there were only 13 of these frogs in existence when we started. Now we know there's at least 28 of them. That's 28 individuals. 
So we doubled their population, hopefully can keep doubling it. We've removed lots of invasive weeds where they were living, planted about 15,000 trees to reforest the habitat. And we have um, gotten to know their community. We got the kids out helping to plant the trees. Uh, we've done beekeeping training so that they don't have to go out to the forest to chop down trees to collect wild honey. So this, I returned there in 2016 with two other Save the Frogs biologists from America. We had the Save the Frogs expedition <clears throat> educated. A um, couple thousand students about amphibians went on the radio, met a lot of um, great new friends, visited the universities, and um, just getting to some of my favorite photos before I close this all out. We found Togo slippery frogs that were doing well. There were seven of them the night we went out. Yeah, so we had the fifth birthday celebration of Save the Frogs Ghana. And it also happened to be the day that we opened up the Save the Frogs Ghana Education Center in that village where the giant squeaker frogs live. <clears throat> the entire village came out, about 500 of them. School was off for the day. Uh, it was also Gilbert. Uh, his birthday. So there were a lot of things happening that day. The chiefs of Yakrom came out. They're very supportive of our efforts and there were presentations throughout the day. That's the education center in the background. We put five computers in there, the first computers in the village. And I was inducted as a chief. <laughs> Gilbert was inducted as a chief as well. So we're now chiefs for life in the village of Yakrom, which is home to about 30 amphibian species. And that gives us a lot of ability to get a lot of work done because we have connections with all the leaders, or we are now the leaders of the village. So my hope is to get a lot more done in Yakrom and throughout Ghana. Uh, I'd like to return to Ghana maybe about a year from now. We'll see what happens. That's the paramount chief of the village, so he's the head guy, so it's good to have these connections. I have all kinds of other stuff I was going to show you. Uh, I'm out of time. Come talk to me if you uh, have any questions, or I think we do actually have a question and answer session. Okay, you can still come talk to me afterwards. Our website, savethefrogs.com, has at least a thousand articles on amphibians, probably everything that I've talked about in more detail. Uh, if you want to come up afterwards and give me your email address, I can put you on our mailing list, which is the best way to stay in touch and find out about a lot of stuff we have going on. Um, the one thing I'll tell you about is that we lead eco tours to take people out to some of the froggiest places on Earth, show you frogs. So next year, June, we're going to Ecuador. July, we're going to Costa Rica. And we can guarantee you a lot of incredible frogs, really cool people on the tour. They're about 11 days each, and you're invited. So come talk to me, find out more, and thank you again to the Aquarium of um, the Pacific for hosting me and everybody. <clears throat>